Hello, and welcome to today's trainer education webinar, Personality Style at Work, The Secret to Working with Almost Anyone, hosted by HRDQ and presented by Kate Ward. Today's webinar will last approximately an hour. Notice that there is a question that may be called a chat box. It's usually located at the right-hand corner of your screen. You want to use this section throughout the webinar to submit any questions that you have. And then we'll either answer those questions as they come in during our live Q&A at the end of our session with Kate, depending on how much time we have, or by email after the session. My name is Sarah Montgomery, and I will moderate today's webinar. I am in business development for HRDQ a publisher of research-based training solutions that improve the performance of individuals, teams, and organizations. Today's presenter is Kate Ward. With more than 20 years of experience, Kate was a manager of curriculum development for CareerTrack, where she authored programs, supervised a team of instructional designers, and facilitated training. She also served as the senior instructional designer at TreeLine Training, responsible for leading the development of the Core Skills Curriculum Library. Currently, Kate is running her own company, working to create innovative training solutions for today's business needs. She is the author of McGraw-Hill's book, Personality Style at Work, The Secret to Working with Almost Anyone, named one of the best career books for 2012 by Wall Street Journal's Finn's Finance. We are so pleased to have Kate share her expertise with us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kate. Sarah, thank you, and thanks to all of you for joining me. Why don't we jump right in? To get started exploring personality styles, I want to share a simple example. Let's say you're on your way into work. You're riding the elevator with a bunch of people, and suddenly the elevator gets stuck, and it won't budge. Someone, perhaps the office jokester, immediately tries to break the tension. So I guess you're all wondering why I called this meeting. Another person reaches for the emergency phone to call for help. Somebody else suggests a game to play while waiting to be rescued. Another person, half joking, half serious, offers a rough estimate of how long it might take for people to use up all the oxygen in the elevator. And yet another person asks if everyone is okay and offers gum or part of her muffins. Classic scenarios like this one bring to mind two questions that life repeatedly illustrates. The first is, why do people react so differently to the same situation? And secondly, why do people exhibit the same behaviors again and again, no matter what the situation? The answer is personality, and that's the purpose of our gathering today. The American Psychological Association defines personality as the unique psychological quality of an individual that influences a variety of characteristic behavior patterns, both overt and covert, across different situations and over time. Jeez, that does not mean much to me. So let's put it in simpler terms. Personality is the consistent pattern of thoughts, feelings and behaviors that makes a person unique. It isn't a reflection of intelligence, and it's not a measure of skills or abilities. There are no wrong or right personality styles. And whether you believe that personality is wired from birth or something that's influenced by life experiences, with a little knowledge and practice, you can make the most of your style and flex to the style of others. So how do you do that? By keeping your eyes open. The good news is that by observing consistent behaviors, personality style is predictable. So let's think back to our elevator story. Or think of a group of your friends. Can you think of the one who is bossy? Even if that person isn't the boss, he or she always seems to be telling others what to do. Or what about the free spirit? Or one who's always the peacemaker? Or maybe the organizer? No matter what the situation or setting, each person usually takes on the same role, and it's those consistent roles that we're going to talk about today. So you may think, why does it matter? And the answer is because sometimes your most important business skill isn't a skill at all. It's your personality. If you can develop a clear understanding of yourself as well as those you deal with, then you can minimize conflict and misunderstandings. You can increase your ability to communicate effectively and to persuade others. You can work more productively in your team, work more effectively with your boss, and even choose a career that suits your personality style best. So let's take a brief look at what we're going to cover in our time together. 
We'll spend a few minutes looking at the basis of the four personality styles, which is assertiveness and expressiveness. And then we'll look at a description of each style and how to speed read observable behaviors. And then most importantly, we'll talk about how to flex to each style when communicating, when dealing with a conflict, and when working in a team. So let's start with your personality style makeup. We'll run two polls here so everyone can see our collective responses. And Sarah is going to help me out by running these polls. Sarah? OK, so our first poll here, simple question, do you ask or tell? And you'll have two options here. So just choose one of those radio buttons. Which one do you tend to do? I tend to ask, or more often, I tell. OK, we've got good participation so far. A couple more seconds here while we get everybody's votes in. OK. OK. Let's go ahead. There you go. All right. Well, as you can see, we have more people who tend to ask um, than tend to tell, uh, which is kind of interesting. So jot down that answer for yourself so you can remember it in a little bit. And then we'll go on to the second question. OK. And so this one here, are you touchy-feely or just the facts? So we may have an international audience here. Um, let me go ahead and launch this first. So everybody can start voting. There we go. So for the international audience out there, um, the, the touchy-feely is a bit of a slang term. So if you're not sure what that means, um, what we're talking about here is do you prefer to share feelings um, instead of avoiding them? Uh, maybe you enjoy close relationships with everyone, not just a selected few. Uh, for those kind of just the facts people out there, what we mean by that is you may uh, sometimes ignore or forget about feelings and are more comfortable working in factual areas. So go ahead and send in those. Oh, OK, we've got great participation here. So a couple more seconds here, and we'll capture everyone. Oh, very interesting split. OK, so let's take a look at what we have here on this one. There you go, Kate. Wow, wow, pretty evenly split, <laughs> and that is interesting. Yeah. OK, so hang on to that that you wrote, wrote down, too, and we will um, get back to those answers in just a second. So the two questions that we just looked at relate to the two dimensions of personality style, which are based on William Moulton Marsden's book he wrote in 1928 called Emotions of Normal People. The first dimension is assertiveness which is the degree to which you try to influence others. Some people are more apt to tell, while others are more apt to ask. And the people who tell are higher on the assertiveness dimension, while the people who ask are lower on the assertiveness dimension. And then the other dimension is expressiveness. And this is the degree to which you share your emotions with others. Highly expressive people are more on the touchy-feely side, while less expression is more of a just-the-facts approach. So when you put these two together, then you get our four-quadrant personality style model. So on the model, here you can see the different ranges of um, assertiveness on the vertical axis and then the expressiveness um, on the horizontal one. And so bringing them together, you get our, our four styles, direct, spirited, considerate, and systematic. So take out your responses and um, plug them into the model and then just take a peek and see where you fall. For example, if you answered ask and just the facts, then your style is systematic. So just take a second to figure out where you are. OK, so let's define each style and then look for the observable cues that you can use to speed read other people's style. One of the things that I really like about this model is that the labels really describe their characteristics. So in other words, direct, considerate, spirited, and systematic these labels already tell you a lot about what each style is like. So let's start with the direct style, which is a combination of high assertiveness, so making a big effort to influence others, and then low expressiveness, meaning that they control their emotions when they're relating to others. Remember our elevator story? That person who reached for the emergency phone to call for help? That's a direct style person. 
Can you relate? Are you decisive, competitive, a risk taker motivated by power and authority? Do you take initiative? Do you thrive on new challenges and look at the big picture? So here's a chance um, for you to chat in and um, think of some people, um, some famous people that might be the direct style. And you chat them in, and they could be um, alive or dead, real or fictional. Sometimes it's easier to think of fictional people than real people. So take a second and um, let me know who you think might be the direct style. <coughs> OK, yeah, absolutely. Um, probably the main person people always think about is Donald Trump. And then there's, um, yeah, Martha Stewart, Hillary Clinton, Tiger Woods. Yeah, those are all great examples. Yeah. And then um, one of my personal favorites from the fictional world is Scarlett O'Hara from Gone with the Wind. Okay, so there are some specific cues that you can use to help identify the style. And they're not even limited to face-to-face -face interactions. You can pick them up by phone or even by email. So first of all, they're called direct for a reason. They don't mince words. You'll hear direct people say things like, you must or you should. They express their opinions readily, and they often interrupt others. They speak quickly, and their volume is often loud. If you think of a coworker who sends you an email, launches into the topic with no greeting, maybe not even signing their name, it's really short and to the point. That's a direct style. So if you find yourself being talked to rather than engaged in a two-way conversation, you're probably talking to a direct style person. So next up, let's look at the spirited personality style, which is a combination of high assertiveness, so they make a big effort to influence others, and then high expressiveness, so they freely display their emotions. Back to our elevator story. The person who suggested playing a game while waiting to be rescued? Yeah, you guessed it. That's the spirited style. These are your cheerleaders. They show lots of enthusiasm, very talkative, easily share their emotions. They're great problem solvers, very persuasive in motivating others, and they themselves are motivated by recognition, by popularity, uh, by praise, and they dislike structure and rules. So what famous people can you think of that might be examples of the spirited style? Why don't you chat a few in? Oh, yeah, I <laughs> see. Richard Simmons, absolutely. Oprah is a perfect example of the spirited style. Robin Williams, yeah. Bill Clinton, very charismatic. Yeah, those are all really good examples. So to identify the spirited style, look for these cues, talking and lots of it. They are enthusiastic, and they use persuasive language, often making sweeping statements and generalizations. You'll hear exclamations such as, wow, or fabulous. They use exaggerated gestures and make frequent eye contact. Like, think of Oprah. You've won a car, and you've won a car, and you've won a car. So in your own workplace, think of a coworker who sent you an email, three different discussions in it, and then stops by your office to talk to you about yet another thing. They like to focus on what's hot and exciting for them in the moment. If you find yourself listening to a great story, you're probably interacting with the spirited style person. Next up is the considerate personality style, which is a combination of low assertiveness Making, meaning they make very little effort to influence others, and high expressiveness, so they tend to express their emotions when relating to other people. Notice that the considerate style is on the opposite end of both dimensions from the direct style. So that tells you that there can be uh, kind of an opportunity to not be on the same wavelength as that, those two styles. Can you guess which person from our elevator story is the considerate style? That last person who asked if everyone was OK, offered gum and something to eat, very considerate. Considerates are exceptional listeners. They make loyalty members, and they're reliable and dependable and friendly. One of the dominant characteristics of the considerate style is they dislike conflict, and they will go to great lengths to maintain harmony. So what famous people might be examples of the considerate style? Sometimes they're a little harder to think of since they often keep a lower profile. But chat them in, and um, I'll share them. 
Yeah, Ellen G. DeGeneres, Jimmy Carter, Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. Mother Teresa, yeah, absolutely. Warren Buffett, those are all great examples. And then my personal favorite from the TV world is Mr. Rogers. So people with the considerate style listen more than they talk. They use inclusive language, and they'll say things like, what if we, or what do you think about? They hesitate to offer their opinions, and they tend to speak more slowly, and often use a softer voice with more pauses than other styles do. They often have a gentle handshake, and they're the most likely of all styles to touch your arm or shoulder when they're talking. So think of a coworker who always asks about your weekend, remembers the names of everyone in your extended family. They'll always make time for you, no matter how busy they are. If you find yourself in a conversation with someone who's deferring to your opinion or point of view, you're probably talking to a considerate person. And um, believe me, I speak from experience here because I'm a considerate. So finally, let's take a look at the systematic personality style, which is a combination of low assertiveness, meaning they make little effort to influence others, and then low expressiveness. So they control their own emotions when relating to others. And this style is on the opposite end of the spirited style. So here, there can be, again, kind of a tendency to maybe have a conflict based on style. So thinking back to the elevator story, did you notice the systematic style? That was the person who offered a rough estimate of how long it might take for people to use up all the oxygen in the elevator. Systematics are conscientious, careful, analytical, and accurate. They're excellent at implementation and following through. And they don't require much social interaction with others. They're motivated by achieving the highest standards of performance. In fact, some may call them perfectionists. So what famous people might be examples of the systematic style? Chat them in, and I'll share. <laughs> I left somebody wrote in my husband, and that's absolutely true for me, too. Bill Gates, absolutely. Um, Albert Einstein. Sure. Kevin Costner? I uh, hadn't thought about that one, but I think that's probably true. Spock? Absolutely. <laughs> OK. So to identify the systematic style, think about these cues. People with a systematic style use precise language. They prefer to discuss facts and figures rather than feelings. And when they do share their opinions, They'll be based on logic and thorough analysis. They tend to speak without much vocal variety. They don't engage in very much small talk or social conversation. Their eye contact may be more limited. Um, they probably have a brief handshake and avoid touching otherwise. They move deliberately, and they use few gestures when communicating. They love sending emails so they can attach spreadsheets and analysis to support their message. So if you find yourself in a conversation that is structured point by point and focused on details, you're probably talking to a systematic person. So now that you've heard all of these descriptions, we're going to do another poll here to find out everyone's style. So this time, instead of just thinking about your initial ask, tell, and touchy-feely answers, think about the descriptions I gave and decide which one sounds most like you. Sarah is going to run this poll. And I just have to add here, one of the reasons I've asked her to help out is because, as I said, I'm a considerate style. And I'm not used to talking for an hour. I'm much more used to listening. So Sarah's going to give me a break here. Sarah? <laughs> sure thing, Kate. OK, so you've got the four options here. It looks like most people here are comfortable with, um, with the radio buttons. You have your four options, direct, spirited, considerate, and systematic. And we've got some good participation here, so I'm going to keep this going for a few more seconds. You may like these results today, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right, it looks like we've captured pretty much everyone here. So let me go ahead and share what we have. OK. You know what? It's kind of, it's not exactly even, but it's pretty spread out like to see all those considerates. And in fact, that doesn't really surprise me because, you know, the training profession is really a helping profession. And that um, 
fits the considerate style's natural strength. So that kind of doesn't surprise me. That that's the most popular one here today. So now that we're familiar with each style, what do you do with this information? I mean, really, the key to using the personality style model is to be able to flex your style. So let's take a look at what that means. Flexing is like being a chameleon. Your basic style stays the same, but you change color to fit better into your environment. You step out of your natural style and take on some of the behaviors of another style in order to get on the same wavelength with that other person. So I usually share an example between my husband and me. I think I mentioned he's a systematic. But I was talking to my son yesterday, and it illustrated this perfectly. He's taking care of my brother's dog, and he was asking how long he could leave the house. And then after he got back, how long he needed to stick around before he could take off again. So we're talking about a teenager here. And he already knew the answer to the first part, because my brother had told him, six hours. So then I told him he needed to stick around long enough for Gracie, the dog, to feel taken care of. And that was like not at all helpful to him. And he finally said, give me a number. And then that's when the light bulb went off for me. He's asking me to flex to him. He's a systematic, and he's asking for that concrete information. And I was giving him an answer from a considerate point of view, you know, take care of the dog, love the dog. So anyway, I gave him a number, and that was the end of the conversation. Once I flexed to him, he was all set. So in the professional world, the ability to flex your style can help you better connect with others, can build rapport, which is really important, helps you communicate more effectively and avoid misunderstandings and minimize conflict, which is something that we all want to do, I think. But while we're at it, let's talk for a second about what flexing isn't. Because flexing isn't telling people what they're thinking or feeling. It's not deciding for others how they should think or feel or behave in a particular situation. It isn't analyzing other people's motivations and behaviors. And it's not encouraging them to be more like you. What you have to remember is that every person is unique and has at least a little bit of each style in them. And that means you, too. So what, that's what gives you the ability to flex to another style. Flexing to certain styles might take more effort than others, but you can do it. And finally, remember to use the personality style model as a tool and not a rule. OK, so let's put all of this to work. Have you ever tried communicating with someone who speaks a different language? Like, sure, you can convey a few thoughts with gestures, but it's nearly impossible to understand completely or even to be understood. Communicating with someone who has a different style from you isn't that extreme, but there can be times when you feel like you just don't understand each other. Communication is both simple and complex at the same time. It's simple, but it's not easy. The trick is making sure that the message that is received by the other person is the same as the message that you intended. So there are three steps that you can take to increase this success. The first is to prepare yourself and the other person. For example, do you know the purpose of the message that you're sending? It's usually to inform, to persuade, or to inquire. And then for the outcome, you want to ask yourself, what do I want the other person to do as a result of my message? And usually, you want the other person to remember something, to decide something or to take some sort of action. So while you're preparing, um, you have to identify the assumptions that could cause the message that's received to be different from the one that you intended. Assumptions, I'm sure you're aware, are beliefs that are the result of our upbringing, of life experiences, and, and current circumstances. So sometimes they're so ingrained that they become like facts to us. So for example, when I was growing up, the only time we spoke loudly it's when we were angry, and it was a rare occurrence. But my best friend's family growing up was filled with six kids, so a loud voice was just a way to get heard, to show excitement. We were coming from two very different places with just that one communication element. So if my friend talks to me in a loud voice, I could think she's mad at me when that's not the case at all. So then the next step is to actually send your message. And the goal here is to just be clear 
and be concise. And as we know, nonverbals play a huge part in sending a message. Posture, eye contact, mannerisms, tone of voice, they all influence how the message is received. So spirited and considerate styles, the ones who are more naturally expressive, are going to do this more naturally. So then the third step is to check for understanding. The considerate style is likely to do this naturally by asking a lot of questions and by practicing active listening. So how do the personality styles fit into the communication process? Let's look at some of their strengths and shortcomings. OK, when communicating, the direct style is short and to the point. You always know where you stand with the direct person. But sometimes that bluntness can um, you know, almost get to the point of insensitivity. And then the spirited style, they use their enthusiasm to create persuasive conversations. You'll never get bored listening to them and talking with them. However, they might become overly sensitive. And so do you see the potential for conflict there? The direct style can be insensitive, while the spirited style can be overly sensitive. Considerate styles are excellent listeners. They work hard to include everyone in conversations, but their desire to maintain harmony means that they may not be completely candid when discussing a touchy, touchy issue. And you can be sure that the systematic communicators will provide information that's accurate and reliable. However, in their attempt to do that, they may come off as know-it-alls and be critical of others. So let's look at the chart that summarizes some of the basic ways we can flex to each style when we're communicating with them. One place I think this is really important is communicating with your boss. You hear that one of the main reasons people leave their jobs is because they don't get along with their boss. And I think, are there really that many bad bosses out there? Mm, maybe, but what if you tried flexing to your boss's style? You might find a common understanding, and then all of a sudden your boss is not so difficult to work with after all. So for example, if your boss has a systematic style, then be prepared with backup information when discussing an issue or a decision to be made. And on the other hand, if your boss has a spirited style, show your enthusiasm. If you bring a point-by-point -point list that would impress a systematic boss, it's not going to impress a spirited boss. So one example of how I use this is just in my email communication. You know, much of my communication with clients happens by email. And I take my lead um, on how to communicate with them by, by their emails. So some people always say, you know, hi, Kate, while others just launch into their message. And some people are chatty, and others stick strictly to business. And I think it works to respond to their messages in the same way. It's just a way of, of building rapport. So um, here at HRDQ, Sarah is the direct. And our exchanges are usually pretty brief and to the point. And then there's another person I work with who's a considerate. And we usually always include, you know, how are you? Hope the weekend was good. Hope all is well, that kind of thing. I have good relationships with both of them. We just communicate with each other in slightly different ways. So let's practice. Um, Sarah, can you read the scenario and run the poll? Sure, Kate. Thanks. OK, so our first scenario here, you're going to choose A and B. So our first scenario here is you are waiting for Rachel again. Finally, Rachel arrives, sits down, and says, so sorry, I was helping Eric finish a report. How was your weekend? Do you have a busy week coming up? Which do you think is the best response that flexes to Rachel's style? So this isn't necessarily what, what comes off the top of your head to do for her, but what do you think would actually work best to build some rapport with Rachel and flex to her style? So A, yes, I'm busy. That's why we need to get down to business. Or B, I had a nice weekend, and I'm swamped this week. How about you? Go ahead and launch the poll. You'll see A and B are listed there, the yes, I'm busy. That's why we need to get down to business. And B is I had a nice weekend, and I'm swamped this week. How about you? see how we do here. OK, we've got good participation. A few more seconds, we'll get everybody's response in. OK, go ahead and share these. And Kate, you want to tell us which one is the correct answer? Yeah. How'd they do? 
we're we're a smart group here, you yeah. guys. Virtually <laughs> everyone got it correct. The correct answer is B. Rachel's a considerate style. And I think you inferred that based on the fact that she got delayed helping someone else. She clearly wanted to make some small talk by asking about you. So if you think about that, then um, no matter what your own style is, and, and especially if it's a director systematic and you don't usually make small talk, you'll ultimately get more done if you just take a couple minutes to connect with Rachel. That would enable her to feel comfortable and then get down to business and accomplish what you want to accomplish. So as we've seen, each style has its strengths and weaknesses, and the styles can certainly collide. But not all conflict is the same. So first, let's t take a look at the three um, primary types of conflict. The first values-based conflict is usually the most serious and difficult to resolve. They involve different concepts of what is right and wrong and good and bad, and it can become really difficult to identify a shared purpose or common goal. Issues-based conflicts involve ideas, actions, decisions, and policies. And usually, if you um, use rational problem solving, it can lead to creative solutions and you can resolve the conflict. And then finally, there's style-based conflict, which tends to be around perceived negative attitudes, behaviors, and motives. And they have a way of growing over time if, if you don't address them. So now that you know, how do you know what conflict you're dealing with? And then in particular, what do you do when it's a style-based conflict? So when you're faced with a conflict, just ask yourself these four questions. First, do I become quickly frustrated when dealing with this person? Do I want to win? Are my emotions related to this conflict out of balance with its importance? Do I find other issues to argue about when I'm dealing with this person? And if you answered yes to any of those questions, you're probably dealing with a style-based conflict. But the good news is, because it's style-based, by using your observational cues of the other person, you can flex to their style and help resolve the conflict. So let's try it out. I think of someone that you recently had a conflict with. Maybe someone who just got your goat once, or it could be a coworker that you just continually struggle with. And see if you can quickly identify their style and then find it on the chart. So you're not looking at your own, but you're finding the other person's style in the graph. Okay. So then, um, review the actions listed under that person's style. These are the things that you can do to, to quickly de-escalate a, a style-based conflict. So um, for example, as I said, I'm a considerate, and I try to avoid conflict whenever I can. And when I worked in the corporate world, I had you know, several different bosses, and one was a direct style. And I had to realize that if something was bothering me, she wasn't going to come to me and say, what's wrong? Do you want to talk about it? I had to address the conflict directly, leave emotion out of it, and just state what was bothering me and what I wanted done about it. And what felt like a big deal to me, being in a conflict, was just part of everyday life to her. And I could really learn from that. So despite my personal desire not to address conflict, it is important. Just ignoring it is going to cause frustration make subsequent interactions more difficult. So there's three steps you can use to address conflict diplomatically. First, state your observations. You want to describe the other person's behavior in specific terms. Leave your emotions out of it for now. So for example, um, you could say, when I asked you a question, you crossed your arms and rolled your eyes. And that would be much more openly received than using labels or judgments like, you acted like I'm an idiot. Um, and actually, the systematic style is going to be able to state neutral observations more naturally than the other styles. So then second, now is the time to state your emotions. Take ownership of how you feel and express your reason for feeling that way. But don't use blaming language like you always or you never. Directs might have to be conscious of that one. And spirited might have to be conscious of like over-exaggerating. And then the considerates and systematics, they might struggle with expressing their feelings at all. So for example, you could say something like, I feel frustrated when you ignore my ideas. And then third, request the behavior you want. And so what's especially important here is to don't say what you don't want, like quit yelling at me. A better choice would be to say, please keep your voice low. 
or to kind of work on the previous example, you could say, please give me feedback, even if you don't like my idea, so that I know you've considered it and thought about it. So you have to remember that confronting the other person like this isn't going to guarantee change. Change is really hard. But you can set yourself up for more success by using the three steps and by flexing to the other person's style. So stress can really play a big part in conflict also, as we all know. It can really escalate conflict. And the thing to remember here is that each style has a different reaction to stress. And basically what happens is that each style kind of goes to the extreme ends of their assertiveness and expressiveness dimensions. So a direct style, when extremely stressed, can become hot-tempered. If you're dealing with someone like that, it's important not to take it personally, because they're going to tend to lash out at anyone. If you set clear boundaries and then follow through on any consequences that you give them, that's really critical to helping deal with a direct person who's under stress. Then stress-spirited styles, they tend to intensify their verbal behavior to an extreme. And what I'm talking about here is like bigger and bigger exaggerations and the magnitude of their emotions is just going to get bigger and bigger. So your goal would be to help them gain control over those actions and words and emotions. If you use a calm and natural tone of voice and remind them that they don't want to hurt other people's feelings, that will help de-escalate de the conflict with them. And then the considerates, as mentioned, they avoid conflict any, at all costs. So their instinct is going to be to sweep it under the rug and ignore it. And that's not going to solve anything. So if you can use gentle confrontation and give a lot of positive feedback, that can help them open up and feel safe. And then the stress systematic can become uncooperative. And many times, the underlying reason behind that is a fear of change. They prefer known routines. Um, so if you can get them involved in the solution, that can really help them buy into making the necessary change dealing with the conflict. So we have another chance to practice, and this time looking at a conflict situation. Sarah, do you want to take over? Sure. So here's your conflict situation. Derek has just found out that a coworker, Claire, received permission to attend a specialized training session being held in another state. Derek confronts his boss about it, saying, that is blatant favoritism. You have always liked Claire better than me, and this just proves it. If you were Derek's boss, what is the best response to deal with this conflict? A, Claire's experience makes her a better candidate to attend this training. She'll be able to immediately put it into practice when she gets back. Or B, Derek, don't get angry about this. You don't know the whole picture. So go ahead and choose. Either Claire's experience makes her a better candidate, or Derek, don't get angry about this. Good. We've got good participation. Keep that coming in. This one's a tough one. OK. Looks like we've got everybody. Let's go ahead and show those results. Oh, OK. Wow, pretty even split. Um, the best response is A. And, and the reason it is is because Derek is direct style. And you could tell that by the fact that he confronted his boss about the issue instead of stewing about it. And he used a pretty blunt approach doing it. The thing to remember here is direct style people, they don't like to be told what to think or feel. And so B is going to be an, an ineffective response there. A works better because it's direct in return. And it focuses on outcome and results, which is something that direct people can relate to. So let's look at another really common situation, which is working in teams. I think we all do that. Let's look at uh, how the styles work in a team setting. And first of all, you might think, well, does that matter? You know, I just do my thing. But um, studies have shown this, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology found that groups of three, four, and five individuals together perform better at complex problem solving than the best of an equivalent number of single individuals. And that can have a significant impact on your organization's success. And not only that, but many teams serve as your social group at work and the place where you find your sense of belonging. 
So you want a team that functions well and productively impacts bottom line results, and you also want one that can increase your job satisfaction. So let's look at how the styles impact team success. Each style is a, a valuable contributor to the team, and the key is getting people with different styles to work together productively so that collectively it strengthens the whole. Directs are comfortable being in charge, and they often want to take the leadership role. They're the team member with the most independent style. Spirited team members are energetic and enthusiastic and motivate others. They offer many ideas and options for creative problem solving. Considerates are the glue that hold the team together. They're good listeners, and they ensure that everybody feels involved and included. And then systematic team members like to get things done. They function best when they have clearly assigned tasks with deadlines. The team will benefit from their critical thinking skills and their attention to detail. So a good performing team has all of these personality styles included. So how does this impact specific team roles? I'm sure your own experience tells you that team members take on different roles. Some are officially assigned, and others are more informal. But a high-performing team takes advantage of each team member's style strengths and then minimizes their weaknesses. There are productive team roles that enable the team to function well. But as with any strength that is over, overused, it can become a limitation. So high-performing teams are aware of both the productive roles and the negative team roles, so they can assign or avoid each of those roles effectively. Like directs will be the first to assign roles and responsibilities to other people, as well as monitor progress. But when they're under pressure, they may get impatient and criticize. The spirited cheerleaders, that um, they often start the brainstorming sessions and infuse the team with their motivation. But if you take it to an extreme, they can struggle to stick with a plan, they can struggle to meet deadlines, and they may perceive rejection where none was intended. The considerates keep everyone in the loop, and they minimize conflict, as we've said. But they can become very passive or dependent without expressing their own opinions. And that can slow down decision making. And then the systematic team member will gather all the information and follow through once decisions have been made. But as we mentioned, when they're under stress, they can become rigid and resistant to change. So let's take a quick look at virtual teams. Nowadays, many of the teams we work on are virtual. You may currently work with a few team members who are sometimes virtual, or maybe your whole team is. My sister-in-law works for a major insurance company. She has a huge geographic territory, and she works from home. I work from, with people from coast to coast, and sometimes we've never even met. And in most respects, virtual teams operate just the same as regular co-located teams do. The strengths and weaknesses and team roles for each style will be apparent on teleconferences and in emails. And in fact, you might want to be extra conscious of the style differences. So uh, like on a conference call, you can't rely on visual body language cues to manage the meeting, like making eye contact with a considerate to encourage them to speak up or making eye contact with a spirited to send them a message to kind of pipe down and let somebody else talk. So to compensate for that, you might want to establish expectations or, or even rules, such as every person will take turns talking, no one speaks twice before everyone speaks once, stuff like that. So we have one more scenario to play with that's dealing with teams, give you a chance to practice. Sarah? OK. Jackie and Tom are members of a software development team. The team is focused on a new application that is to be rolled out next month. Jackie is the senior member and feels responsible for the team's reputation. She believes the current version doesn't have enough bells and whistles. Tom believes the reputation will be more affected by the number of bugs still in the software and thinks they should eliminate those before adding new features. If you were Jackie, what would you say to Tom? A, Tom, if you brainstorm with me, we'll be able to quickly figure out the best features to add. Or B, Tom, how about if you create a list of the bugs and the approximate time it will take to fix each one? OK, so the poll is live there. You can go ahead and choose between A or B. OK. 
good. This one seems a little easier than the last one. Looks like we almost have everyone. I'll give it another couple seconds. People make their choices. Okay. And there are your results, Kate. Okay. Majority of people chose B, and, and I would agree with that. Tom is a systematic style, and you can tell that by his attention to what is wrong with, rather than what is right. So if you think about this, brainstorming with him isn't going to generate the ideas that Jackie is looking for. On the other hand, if you give Tom the role of investigator and organizer, that will play to his strengths. Okay, well, it's time to wrap up. We're going to wrap up with um, this next chart that serves as a summary of how to quickly distinguish the four personality styles. I hope our time together has given you a taste of how to use the personality style model to improve communication, to reduce conflict, and increase your ability to influence others in a way that will increase your satisfaction at work. We've only touched on a few ways to use the model. You can also use it to be a better manager and leader, to figure out your ideal career or work environment, or even to improve relationships with friends and family. And while it seems like you have to do all the work of flexing to other people, I think you'll find that when you are adaptable and work to meet the needs of others, you're likely to find that your own needs will be met as well. And that's a win-win situation that benefits everyone. Great. Thank you very much, Kate. So today's presentation gives you highlights from the book Personality Style at Work, um, Secret to Working with Almost Everyone. And so we do have, it looks like, a few minutes to take some questions. So I'm going to go over a little bit about the book, but go ahead and type in your questions. Use that um, question in chat box, and um, we'll be able to get through a couple of those uh, before we close out today. Any questions that we don't get to answer, you will get all of those by, um, by email, everyone that's attending today. Um, but so the book today here um, explores also leadership and time management along with the conflict and team building uh, that Kate mentioned. There is also a free assessment that is included in the books that you can actually dig deeper into your own personality style. For joining us today, the book is an exclusive low price of $9. It's almost 50% off. And it's open for all quantities. So if you want to get a couple for coworkers or for your team, um, you can do that as well. You want to use coupon code WebinarPSAW, P-S-A-W-9, with the number 9 at the end, right when you go to checkout. And that's good until July 31st, 2013. So don't miss out on that. Okay, and it looks like I actually have some questions that have kind of come in as we've gone gone through the session. So I'm going to go ahead and start, but you can keep sending those in, and, and we'll jump around here depending on our time. So Kate, our first question here is from Jerry, and um, Jerry asks, um, can, can you be a combination of more than one personality style? Um, yes, <laughs> and I probably should have mentioned that a little bit more. Um, I did say that we all have a at least a little bit of every style in us. You probably have one style that's more dominant th than the others, but um, we all have a unique combination of each of the four styles. And that's one thing that helps you flex to the other styles. So um, if you take the online assessment that Sarah just mentioned, it'll help you determine your um, kind of your unique combination of the styles. And that'll help you better understand yourself and how to flex to other people. Great, thank you. We have a question from um, Kevin. Um, uh, Kevin states, um, so, so it seems like most successful leaders are direct or spirited in, in thinking through his experience. Um, and so he's questioning, you know, what if, what if he's not that style? Um, does he need to adapt to then, you know, be successful in a leadership role? Um, yeah. Well, you know, it is true that the direct style, and um, because of their tendency to want to cha take charge, and then the spirited style because they tend to attract followers, it is true that it kind of makes them more natural leaders, and they seem to be the ones who get all the attention. But there are successful leaders who are considerate or systematic. And I think we mentioned Warren Buffett as a considerate, Bill Gates as a systematic. And the fact is, um, each style has a leadership strength associated with it. So a considerate like Warren Buffett is great at supporting and developing his staff. 
and systematics are great at achieving really high standards of performance. So I think when you're aware of your own strengths and use those, that can um, enable you to be a good leader, just as good as a direct or spirited style. Great. OK. Um, we, ha we have a ton of questions coming in, so I'm just sort of sort <laughs> sorting through them, because um, my screen here is scrolling relatively quickly. Um, so that's great. I love the participation. Keep sending those in. Um, let me see if I can, I can pick one here quickly. Um, OK, so uh, we have one here from Marta. And uh, Marta um, asks, um, I, I have a coworker that I just don't get along with, um, and that I have tried everything. Uh, at least, you know, it feels like she's tried everything. So, kind of, you know, what 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 kind of advice maybe can can you give to Marta to kind of help with that coworker that she just does not get along with? Yeah, ugh, that is frustrating. And I guess the first thing I'd say is um, kind of taking the high road is just try again using some of the information we discussed today. Um, it, frankly, set your expectations low and just look for small improvements in like one area. And then maybe you can build on that. And then you know, I have to say, there's a reason that the subtitle of the book is The Secret to Getting Along with Almost Anyone. There are going to be some people that we just don't get along with. And I would say, if that's the case, in this case, um, just kind of accept it. Try to limit your interactions with that person as much as possible, and then um, focus on the aspects of your job and the people that you do enjoy. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate, for your time today. We have truly enjoyed working with you. And thank Thanks, you, everyone. Um, oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And thank everyone on the line today for your participation. Yeah. Um, we have uh, run out of time today. But um, go ahead and continue to send in those questions that we have. Kate will respond to all of those. Um, we'll send those out by email. We do appreciate your time, and we hope you found today's webinar informative.